What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Ali Impossible reaction. We're jumping into the next one on our oversimplified journey, the Napoleonic Wars, part one. But we're gonna split it into two parts, uh, just for time purposes. If we get to that mid part and you want to keep watching it, the link is right there inside the description. Go watch it on Oversimplified's channel. That's what this is all about, anyway. Uh, let's jump into it. Let's check it out together. See what we got going on. A learning excursion. One of the best damn kind of ways to learn ever. Let's go. It's coming at us from Mikhail. Much, much love. Let's learn something. It was made possible by NordVPN. Stay safe online by clicking the link below and get a huge discount off a two-year plan with a risk-free 30-day money-back guarantee. Also, why not grab yourself a character pin of the little why not himself grab a before character they sell pin. out? And big shout out to the patrons. Head on over to learn about benefits such as Discord access and maybe even a little behind-the-scenes content. Okay, Mrs. Bonaparte, this is it. One last push and we're done. <laughs> Congratulations, it's a general. Oh, and here comes the rest of the army now. Well, that was quite fast. Uh, did you just say the rest of the army? <laughs> what the fuck? The facial expressions are priceless. Oversimplify, you didn't kill it with this one. History is full of what great conquerors, many with very impressive origin stories. For example, Alexander the Great was the son of a king. Julius Caesar came from an aristocratic family that descended from a goddess. Great conquerors don't usually come from relatively insignificant families living on impoverished islands. But as it just so happens, that is where our story begins. In the early 18th century, the island of Corsica was a part of the Republic of Genoa, until one day Corsica said, hey, we're declaring independence, and it's probably not worth your time to try and stop us. So Genoa said, you're right, it isn't worth our time. <laughs> hey friends, you want to buy this island? And France said, sure thing. And thus, Corsica became... Damn. This is really, truly the best way to see it. Are you give me a visual like this, I don't remember anything. That is... A hell of a way to go. Hey, France, you want to buy this island? And France said, sure thing. And thus, Corsica <laughs> became France, just in time for Napoleon to be born French. Many Corsicans didn't appreciate their new conquerors, however. And from an early age, Napoleon well, developed some got cocky in the, French in the jump. Napoleon's dad, however, quickly embraced his new French overlords, which created some tension between dad and son. Ooh, look at me. I'm dad. I wear powdered wigs and silver buckled shoes, and I'm a traitor to the Corsican people. Go to your room, Napoleon. No, you go to your room, dad. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> On the other hand, Napoleon adored his mother, who was definitely the disciplinarian of the family. And even though she would punish Napoleon severely, he kind of respected that. But Napoleon's parents wanted the best for their family. And since they were a very minor nobility, they were able to have Napoleon sent off to the shining lights and rat infested sewage puddles of the big city. Napoleon went to military school in France. Okay, Napoleon, why don't you introduce yourself to your new classmates? Well, I'm Napoleon, and I hate all of you. Your farts smell like cheese, you can't pronounce the letter R, all you do is go on strike, and you call <laughs> eggs oofs like a bunch of big dumb idiot dingleberries. Uh, okay. <laughs> I love the creative liberties. Uh, I really, really thanks, do. Thanks, Napoleon. I hope you like being bullied. And bullied, he was. They picked on him for his Corsican accent, his family's lack of wealth, and it probably didn't help that he also had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. But he could hold his own, and on an average day, might be found dishing out ratatouille sandwiches for breakfast. He spent My much God. of his time alone, and he loved reading about the great conquerors of history. He learned about Julius Caesar, and he wondered if one day he too might have a pizza franchise named after him. He excelled at math and geography, and when he graduated at the age of 16, he was made second lieutenant in an artillery regiment. Now, second lieutenant might sound pretty sweet to a screw-up like you, but Napoleon <laughs> had a little something called ambition. Stonks of it. And he wasn't content being just some junior officer. He wanted to rise the ranks. Unfortunately for him, that would be a little difficult. Well, Napoleon, I've reviewed your application. It's clear you're very skilled and would be a perfect fit for the promotion. And Simeon, you're just about the biggest idiot I've ever seen. Your test results suggest you have the mental aptitude of a senile earthworm. And in the part of the form where you list your experience, you seem to have drawn a picture of a gerbil giving birth to a shoe. But your dad is the Marquis de la Fufayette, so you get the job. What the French society was just too closed off. Positions were handed out based on nobility, not talent. 
And the young Napoleon probably felt stuck. Wouldn't it be nice if, say, a revolution came along and changed all of that? Well, what are the chances? The French Revolution is here. Bastille <laughs> toppling. The dude's riding down the river in a barrel. This is amazing. Well, what are the chances? The French Revolution. Who ever been this happy and smiley w learning about history before? Nobody ever. Revolution is here. Bastille toppling. Head chopping. King popping. The revolution promised to do away with the old social hierarchy and make everyone a little more equal. Napoleon may not have cared much for the violent mobs, but if it meant he could rise the ranks, he was in. He began fighting to defend the revolution. He put down a British-sponsored counter-revolution in Toulon and got promoted. He put down a royalist uprising in Paris and got promoted. And as his military prowess became more recognized, he was even given his very own army. It was astonishing progress for such a young man of humble origins. And Napoleon's wildest dreams were coming true. <laughs> but Napoleon also <laughs> believed anime, Napoleon. he could increase his social status if he married an older rich lady. And so around this time, Napoleon went on the prowl. However, if some sources are to be believed, he was a verified creep. He reportedly had terrible luck with women, and most wanted nothing to do with him. Fortunately, he eventually met Josephine, an aging single mother who was deeply in debt and needed stability. So she agreed to marry him, despite finding him intensely disgusting. Napoleon, you dirty- He doesn't look disgusting. Dog, you've done it. Unbeknownst to Napoleon, however, Josephine had a bit of a promiscuous reputation. Hey, Napoleon, I hear you're marrying Josephine. Boy, she sure is a great kisser. That's right. Hey, wait, what do you mean she's a great kisser? Hey, Hugo, you hear Napoleon's marrying Josephine? Wow, she sure is a great kisser. Now, hang on just a minute, <laughs> everyone. Napoleon's marrying Josephine. Oh, yeah, she's wow. yeah, she she sure is a great kisser. Real good at kissing. Oh, wow. I'm pretty sure I kissed her. Oh, for <laughs> goodness sake, is there anyone here who hasn't kissed my wife? Yeah, you. <laughs> As Napoleon fell madly in love with his new wife, oh she fell madly in love with a man named Hippolyte. It wouldn't be long, however, before Napoleon would leave home and go to war. Because while France was having its revolution, tensions in Europe were rising. Hey, Austria, you'll never guess what we just did. What's that, France? I got two words for you. Revolution. We totally just socked it to our monarchy. What? Dude, the rest of us... Our monarchies. You've just totally threatened the balance yep. of power in Europe. Yep. Now we have to worry about our stinky peasants rising up against us. I mean, holy hell, your queen is... Okay, friends, this is pretty awkward. <laughs> and the rest of Europe is probably itching to give you a wedgie. But you're not ready for a war yet. So you gotta be cool, man. You better calm it's down. It's absolutely you crucial go. that you say something to defuse the situation... That's not gonna happen. ...right now. Preposterous! I declare war. Sacre bleu! <laughs> so France ended up at war with basically the rest of Europe, and the war of the First Coalition began. At first, France struggled, but then they started to do surprisingly well, and in many conquered territories, they began to establish sister republics, exporting their revolutionary ideas across Europe. In 1796, they planned a three-pronged attack to take Vienna and knock Austria out of the war, with two magnificent armies in the north to kick ass, and Napoleon in the south as a bit of a diversion. For the first time, Napoleon would lead a military campaign. This was his chance to prove himself, to be somebody. And what a general he proved to be. The army he was given were demoralized, lacking equipment, and underpaid. But Napoleon galvanized <laughs> Not them with twinkies. inspirational speeches, and he took them into Italy. He was outnumbered, and his campaign was partially meant to be a sideshow, but he made it the main show. While the two northern armies were being held back, Napoleon made staggering progress. In a signature Napoleon move, he masterfully split his enemies into two and took them on separately, knocking Sardinia out of the war and putting the Austrians on the run. At the famous Battle of Lodi, he was in the fray, aiming the cannons himself, getting covered in mud, and earning the total respect of his men. They respected him so much that when he ordered an almost suicidal assault on the only bridge in town, his men threw themselves at it and took it despite fierce Austrian resistance. For Napoleon, it was all he needed to confirm that he was the greatest human who had ever existed. Wow, Napoleon, you're pretty great at this military stuff. Just be careful your head doesn't get too big. Yeah. What did you just say to me, little prick? <laughs> and as Napoleon swept through northern Italy, the Italians cheered his arrival. Oh, yes, man. I'm here to liberate you from your cruel Austrian oppressors. Here I am. And replaced them 
with French ones. Aww. Napoleon Aww. plundered as he went, sending riches back to France to help its economy, but also paying his men the first real money they'd seen in years. The Pope had been supporting the Austrians, so Napoleon briefly went to go give him a slap, and as he began to approach <laughs> Vienna, the exhausted Austrians were forced to make peace, with Napoleon overseeing negotiations himself. He Sign had it. just single-handedly knocked Austria out of the war. And by the way, he was only 28, so yeah, maybe it's about time you moved insane. out of your dad's attic. In the Italian territories he had conquered. 28. What are 28 year olds now doing? I know when I was 28, I damn sure didn't know, even know what I wanted to do yet. Napoleon established new French sister republics, even writing constitutions and organizing governments himself. Not something a general generally does. When he got back to France, he was hailed as a hero, and the extremely unpopular government were concerned he might get some power-hungry ideas. So they agreed he should go far away from France to Egypt, where he could maybe undermine British access to India. Napoleon was eager to win more glory, so he brought with him a team of scholars, and he was like, whoa, it's a freaky man-cat. Whoa, it's a big <laughs> stick. Whoa, it's an ugly horse. Whoa, whoa, it's a stumpy little manlet. Hey. A stumpy little manlet. I'm stealing I'm actually some of these. average height for the time. <laughs> but then British Admiral Nelson came down and wrecked his fleet, and an Anglo-Ottoman force defeated him at Acre. So Napoleon abandoned his men and went back to France. His we campaign in Egypt hadn't gone quite as planned. But one thing you should know about Napoleon was that he was a skilled propagandist. He published his own newspapers that sometimes exaggerated his achievements and even We have to go back just to read the newspaper. Propagandist. He published his own newspaper. Oh my god, wait a minute. I have to read part of this. You guys, it's up on the screen. Read it to Napoleon Bonaparte, who's just an all-around mega fresh dude, landed in Egypt last July and embarked on an adventure for the ages and covered hidden mysteries of the ancient world. Such a freaky cat man, a big stick and an ugly horse. Experts say his expedition left them comforting, oh, contorting with joy. Some of the locals tried to oppose the French presence, but Napoleon ruthlessly crushed these savage brutes and or won them over with gentle, compassionate love. Whichever narrative you prefer. This is genius. This is the whole thing. Because the fact that you can stop it and actually have a full-on story. But the story does continue. I see it says a flying elbow drop. We get this. <laughs> Finish reading it. Look at that sucker daddy's eyes. I'm too hot to handle. Too cold to hold. <laughs> Tower of power. Too sweet to be sour. <laughs> Oh, simplify, we love you. This is brilliant. Everybody, take the time to go over there and read this newspaper. That sometimes exaggerated his achievements and even commissioned paintings that generally made him look cool. So when he returned to Paris, he was yet again hailed as a hero, and he began to get some power-hungry ideas. First, however, he had a bit of a problem to deal with. See, he had learned something shocking about his dear <laughs> wife. Really, Josephine? This guy? I'm just as tall as him. I'm sorry, I swear. Now that you're becoming famous, I'll never do it again. Make sure you don't. I've never stooped so low as to cheat on you. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll be in this room consulting my generals for the next 30 minutes. And by consulting, I mean boinking. By my generals, I mean this woman. And by 30 minutes, I mean two seconds. <laughs> Having dealt with his wife, Napoleon was then approached by a very influential politician who said he had an idea. He wanted to stage a coup against the deeply unpopular government and needed the extremely popular Napoleon's help. And Napoleon thought that was just the darn tootinest idea. The plan the was to trap the government and convince them to voluntarily give up their power. And here's how they did it. Hey guys, oh my gosh, quick! There's a dangerous Jacobin plot to overthrow you which we definitely aren't just making up. Better get inside this cage so we can protect you. Okay. <laughs> Gentlemen, we got him. In this case, the cage was an isolated palace outside of Paris, with no one around but Napoleon and his army. With the government inside, Napoleon then entered, and a pretty chaotic event ensued, during which the government didn't seem entirely sure what was going on, Napoleon's men didn't seem entirely sure what was going on, and Napoleon himself didn't seem entirely sure what was going on. But thankfully, Napoleon's brother Lucien, president of the lower house managed to regain control and the remaining councilmen were intimidated into creating a new constitution and thus a new government was Huzzah! formed this time with three consuls in charge but after napoleon did some rewriting in the end there was really only one man in charge the first consul him and over the next few years he worked to consolidate even more power and essentially became a dictator in total control 
of France. He had ambitions. He By had the way, goals. He was only 30. So maybe it's about time you washed your disgusting bed sheets. France was now ruled by... <laughs> she washed her bed sheets at least once a week. Possibly the greatest I'm just military saying, leader it should of be the time. Done. Possibly the greatest? <laughs> or definitely. Well, now is his chance to prove it. See, back when Napoleon was still in Egypt being Indiana Jones. Back home, <laughs> France was in France being France. They had conquered even more territory. And they were like, hey, Piedmont, you get revolutionary ideals. Hey, Switzerland, you get revolutionary ideals. Poof. And Rome, Poof. you get revolutionary ideals. Everybody uh, gets revolutionary ideals. Oh, hey guys, out. nice sledgehammers. And Naples, very cool nail gun. You guys here to get some revolutionary ideals? <laughs> As France was still spreading the revolution, and with Napoleon busy in Egypt, the oh European powers God. felt the time was right for round two, and the war of the second coalition began. And this time, their big bad boy buddy Russia was here to bang some French boys back to Bordeaux. And bang them, they did. France got blasted. But then Russia pulled out after stolen in Switzerland, and now that Napoleon was in charge of the country, he was ready to start blasting right back. He took command of the army of the reserve, and he brought the fight to the Austrians. Now, there are many traits that made Napoleon a great military leader. I already mentioned one of them, how he was one of the boys and commanded the total loyalty of his men. But now we see a second reason, the element of surprise. In 1800, Napoleon moved to Geneva, and it looked like he was probably going to take on the Austrian forces in Germany. There's no way he'd be crazy enough to move his entire army south through the Alps as a surprise attack on the Austrians besieging Genoa. But oh, Napoleon's moving his entire army south through the Alps as a surprise attack on the Austrians besieging Genoa. Napoleon I can't even imagine what these troops had to go through, though. This crossing of the Lord. Alps is legendary. He and must you have really him. loved the man to follow him over some damn mountains. One of the most famous paintings of the general, popping a sick wheelie on his majestic stallion, surrounded by dangerous mountain terrain. Of course, in real life, he made the crossing on a depressed mule. But that's not as cool. <laughs> when he emerged in Italy, the Austrians expected him to come break their siege. But Napoleon went for their supply line near Milan, forcing the Austrians to meet Napoleon head-on at the famous Battle of Marengo. The Austrians initially clobbered the outnumbered French, and they were like, hooray, we won. But then a few hours later, Napoleon showed up again with an even bigger army, and he clobbered them right back. Holy cow, this tiny little fun-sized French guy is running rings around us. <laughs> fun-sized French guy. I'm average height for the time, you <laughs> jerk! Then, after General Moreau's victory at Hohenlinden, Vienna was exposed, and the Austrians again sued for peace. Just like the War of the First Coalition, the Second Coalition ended in another French victory. But in many ways, they both felt more like Napoleon victories. Only the UK remained at war with Napoleon, and they were using their powerful navy to blockade French ports and were even seizing the cargoes of neutral ships. Obviously, everyone else got pretty pissed off that the British were interfering with their trade. So in response, uh, yeah. they formed a league, and they embargoed the UK right back. Neutral countries protecting their own interests? That's offensive. So Britain <laughs> went to offensive. Copenhagen Everything's and offensive. blew a bunch of stuff up, and the league disbanded. But because the UK's economy was pretty bust, they decided to sign a treaty with France in 1802. For the first time in a long time, Europe was at peace. Hey, right here is where we are going to pause today's episode. Congratulations, sire. We're going to pause today's episode right here. I encourage you, I implore you to go over and finish the episode on Oversimplified's channel. The link is right there inside the description. I will see you tomorrow for part two of part one. Smash the like button if you liked it. The dislike button, but I won't believe you. Tell the next one of my the combustible. You guys be happy, healthy, safe. Let me to the move to back. Peace.